spectrum. Good morning and welcome to Live with Joan and we're in our special series of how to help animals and today we have a very 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 special guest someone that I've also I, I'm going to sound like a stalker because I feel like I've stalked so many people but this is somebody who's photographs I have admired for years and years and years and just they take my breath away and she photographs the wild mustangs so we are going to have quite a conversation about that um and um what um what is happening in their world so if you're new to me my name is Joan Ranquet I'm an animal communicator author Founder of communication with founder of communication with All Life University and a TEDx speaker. I forgot to say, um, and I'm also um, going to be an author. I shouldn't even be saying that. I've got I've signed. I'll announce it next week. But um, anyway, uh, communication with All Life University is a program for people who want to learn animal communication or become an animal communicator who want to learn energy healing or become an energy healer. And we are building out the nature and wildlife. We're gonna have a whole bunch of courses coming out here in the next couple of months. Um, we've got a lot of stuff going on with the school. And we have coming up the spring intensive, which is April 1st through the 9th. And in that, um, it's three days of animal communication, three days of EFT tapping and three days of animal communication and healing in sanctuaries. And this is one of my most favorite times of the year. I love the intensives because it's like I, I get excited thinking, oh, my people are coming. Um, we, I don't think we have any spots left to do it live, but we still have spots left for the virtual component, which would be online. And we have a, um, Claudia will say, we have a great virtual community. I mean, my whole world is virtual, right? Like here I am with you guys now on a live and then at 11, I'll go on and teach advanced animal communication, behavior and dynamics. And then five o'clock, I'll do the same thing. And I'm on with people every day. So we have a very rich community and then it just gets richer during the intensive. So if it's something you wanna do, I'm going to actually say this because I will have more books coming out when I announce the secret. Um, and it's going to change things, right? It's going to change because I have to write. Um, and I'm pretty disciplined about being able to do that. But eventually, you know, as the world is opening, there are going to be, um, there are going to be book tours and things like that. So there's going to be an opportunity for, me to move about the planet and meet people and um <clears throat> but it also is going to you know change things so i know that for example the next couple of intensives you can come to but there's going to come a point in time when it's going to be exclusive just to the school so if it's something you want to do and you want to check us out it would be really fun to have you and if you cannot make that kind of a nine-day commitment we have the animal communication level one starting april 27th and we also have energy healing for animals starting may 12th and that is going to be tapping and again maybe there's going to be a book about that subject maybe um and so i have a feeling that people are going to want to learn from me um and the teaching that we do in the school so if you want to do that you have two chances sooner than not that is at the spring intensive or May 12th. So that's um, my shameless plug. Um, is anyone here? Uh, yes, uh, Heidi Evans uh, Lensley, sorry, wow, says <laughs> hi. Shannon says yay, hi to both of you. Hi Shannon, Jane Wu says good morning. Good Charlie morning. Kale says good morning everyone. Marsha Weiser um, has a little box and a heart. Uh, Chris Wilson, hi everyone. Aaron Endoscopes says good morning. I guess um, Aaron commented on the the promo that uh, Carol Walker did pictures of her animals before. Oh my God! Wow! How crazy is that? That's so cool. 
Yeah, and um, uh, let me see, Sir Charlie Kale says you're so humble, Joan. Yes, everyone wants to learn from you. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there's a chance that people are gonna want to learn. I don't know. What, I mean, I really what you're teaching. What I'm teaching. I mean, I I know that, but I mean, you read the first couple of chapters. You tell you tell me, Claudia. Um, I can say this as a student, a graduated student and a practitioner, I still, I found it super valuable. And I also looked at it through the eyes of someone who had never done what you might be talking about, which I don't know, because you know, you haven't really done anything. Supposedly, um, it is very valuable to any human being who has ever had, will have, considers having an animal. That's all I have to say. There you go. Yeah. It's a lot about behavior and what have you, but not that there is a book deal. Anyway. No, there is not. Yeah. Maybe <laughs> I've signed and I'm just waiting for. Anyway. Um, so, shall we, um, anyone else? Uh, yeah. So, Judith Boyle. Hello from Washington. Hello. Susie Reed. Hi, Susie. Yeah, it'd be Heather fun to hear. Oh, Heather. Heather Ann. That's yeah. so great. With her little baby. Um, it'd I be know. fun to hear where people are from. Lorraine Mullinger says, hello. Hi, hello, Lorraine. You know what? I almost tagged you this morning because I saw that you put something up about a Mustang. So I knew you had to be here today. Yeah, I messaged her after I saw that post. She oh. goes, oh, trust me. I put everything on hold for the morning. Okay, I got good. the message. Okay. Um, let me see. Uh, Chris Wilson says she can't wait for the book. Um, Judith Boyle says I have photos of my OTTBs. What Off the track thoroughbreds. Thank you. That's I'm what I, I'm, I'm an OTTB girl. She says, I, uh, of my uh, OTTBs that Carol just knew when I lived in Colorado. I also have several of her, um, uh, the, the, the SWB, the Save the Wild Horses, um, and her photos are awesome. Uh, and Susie wants to know if this is a new book you're talking about. Maybe. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> Diane Matthews says hi. Hi, Susie. Hi, Diane. She loves me. I love Susie. Okay. Okay. So let's bring um, on our guest. We lost her. Oh, all right. We lost her. She's coming back. She's coming back. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to go ahead and introduce her. And um, just give me one second. There we go. Okay. Uh, oh, and she's on. Okay, okay perfect. Good. Okay. Well, I'm, I beg your patience. Carol Walker's passion for photography started at an early age with animals as her favorite subjects. She studied literature and photography and as an undergraduate at Smith College and continued her education in photography after graduating, studying portraiture and nature photography. She has traveled all over the world photographing wildlife for the past 35 years. In 2000, Carol started her business, Living Images by Carol Walker, um, www.livingimagescarolwalker.com, spe specializing in photographing horses. Carol's stunning images masterfully showcase horses at Liberty. She has taught horse photography workshops for the past 10 years in Dubai, France, Germany. Um, one second. Sorry, France, Germany, uh, I was just trying to, and across mm. the United States. She sells her fine art prints from her website as well as in several galleries in Colorado and has won numerous awards. Carol's work in photography and with Wild Horses was featured in Horse Illustrated Street February 2017 issues. She has won multiple awards at Colorado art shows, including Best in Show in four juried shows and Best in photo Photography in 14 juried shows on the front range of Colorado. 18 years ago, Carol began photographing wild horses. As she followed several herds in Wyoming, Colorado, and Montana, she became aware of how precarious their situation on public lands has become. Since then, she has dedicated herself to educating people with their photographs and stories about, about wild horses. Her three books, Wild Hoofbeats, America's Vanishing Wild Horses, Horse Photography, The Dynamic Guide for Horse Lovers, and the latest, Galloping to Freedom, Saving the Adobe Town of Luces, are all multiple award winners. Carol sees her artwork as an ideal vehicle for enhancing and expressing her advocacy 
for wild horses and the proceeds from the sales of her artwork and books fund her mission. As one of the leading advocates of America's wild horses, she dedicates herself to stopping their roundup and removal from America's public lands and keeping them wild and free. I got through that without crying and I'm bringing Carol on. Hello. Hi, Carol. So Hi. How are you? I'm good. How are you? It's great to be here. Good. Great. Uh, I'm so excited to have you here because I want to talk everything from how you got started to um, what happens out there with the wild horses. We're having a little feedback again. Yeah, I think, uh, Carol, could you... I asked you that and you and you said no and I can go run. Yeah, we were Lauren, Joan, sorry. It's okay, Carol. Joan, lower yeah. the volume a little bit on the iPad. I apologize. Okay, okay. I'll go is that enough? Or is that is that enough? Or do you need me to go grab a headset? Are we okay? I can't hear you. Okay. Hi, Carol. Joan has to leave and come back. You, you want me to leave and come back? She's coming back. It's okay. uh, her when her phone rings, the volume goes dead. So I apologize to everybody. Okay. Just hang on for the ride. Okay. I'm back. <laughs> Sometimes it's a little okay. wild ride. Hmm. Um, Great. All right. So um, I would love to hear, um, we heard in your bio that you studied art. How did you get started with just uh, photographing? Did you start with photographing like dogs as portraits or horses or how did you get started? To photograph wildlife all over the world. And I was at the Na North American Nature Photographer Summit and I was showing my pictures to somebody, and they said, well, you says, what, where are your horse pictures? And I said, oh, okay, I can bring those. And then they said, you should be photographing wild horses. And I said, wild horses? I've never even been to wild horses. And the next week, someone emailed me and said, would you like to go to the Red Desert of Wyoming and photograph wild horses? And I said, well, of course. First spent uh, with the gentleman uh, on a tour in Adobe Town, Wyoming, and absolutely fell in love with the horses. Uh, um, we we stopped in this one area. We saw ears sticking up over the sagebrush, and there was a whole family of wild horses taking a mid-morning nap. And the stuff, and he starts running toward me. And he has scars all over his body. And I didn't know what was going to happen. And he stopped. And then his filly gets up and comes forward. And she has this grin on her face looking at me. And I was just, I was just so stunned and so in love with these horses right away. I, I watched them. They, they watched me. We just sat with each other for a while. And I decided I had to continue coming back to visit these horses. So in Adobe Town, which is in, it's the middle of nowhere in Wyoming, I would go once a month and spend time with the horses. And I, several families got to know me so that I could get close, too close. I could get close enough to photograph them and they wouldn't run away. So, and I spent time with them. And then I found out that most of them were going to be rounded up and we had a roundup in 2005 and I was absolutely heartbroken and I went to the roundup because I wanted to see what happened and helicopters chase these horses who were running for their lives and they came into these traps with pen, with uh, pens and were immediately separated 
mares from the foals from the mares, and they were trucked off. And I, I didn't understand how they could be so cruel to these horses. And when I found out they were only going to return a few of the horses to the area, I was so upset and I, I thought, what can I do to help? People need to know horses are not starving to death. They don't need to be removed from our public lands and that they deserve to be protected and kept safe. And that's when I did my first book, Wild Hoofy. And I became a wild horse advocate, speaking out, um, speaking in front of people, educating people, letting people know about the wild horses. And I really thought that in three, three or four years, we would save them. But here it is, 2022, and the horses are more in jeopardy of being annihilated. And most of them are Wait, um, she, uh, the last part you cut out a little bit, but most of them are what? She froze. Oh. Yeah, so we found uh, someone that shares your internet. Yeah, issues. someone else who has my awesome interwebs. Um, yeah. here for now in case she drops off. Okay, she dropped off. <clears throat> in case, yeah, she dropped off. So hold on, she might come back. So everybody, uh, from what Carol explained to me, she lives in a very rural area and she has, um, it, bad is an understatement from what she told me, uh, internet. So we're lucky to even get her for the bits that we do get her. And we both laughed because we said we will trade internet any day for being able to live in the country. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Um, she should be back soon, but um, okay. So we've got a cut. Let me go ahead while she's ready. Okay, and here she comes. I'm back. Looks like my internet died. <laughs> mm. Okay. Okay. So the last I heard was that you had, um, that the horses were not starving. You thought that um, three or four years this would be done, and here they are in more jeopardy than ever. Than ever before. And um, so what really needs to happen is that we need to be able to work with Congress and work with the Department of Interior to save our wild horses. As of this date, the new Secretary of the Interior, Deb Haaland, has refused to meet with any wild horse groups. Um, and the new head of the BLM, Tracy Stone Manning, has not met with anyone either. And to just be completely blocking a dialogue is outrageous. I mean, these are our public servants. This is our government. They should be working with us. And um, so we're doing everything we can to stop the roundups and stop in many herds right now. They're trying to um, sterilize the herds, um, do birth control that's permanent. I'm in favor of using birth control um, to manage the population of a herd, but not the type that's harmful to the animals or that will completely sterilize them. Yeah, I know. <clears throat> yeah, I've seen that develop over the years. So, just for a moment, um, let's let's think about the the country for a moment. I know that you've photographed. I think every iconic herd there is. Uh oh, there she goes. Um, hmm. We lost her again. Yeah. There she is. Okay. Okay. Um, I think you've photographed every iconic herd there is. And I'm wondering if um, maybe you could share with people like what they're like. Um, all the herds are different. So in Adobe Town, um, which is the first herd that I went to and 
really, I, I have loved these horses for a long time. They tend to be very um, wild. They're very skittish. Uh, sometimes I just get out of my car and they're gone. And then sometimes I'm lucky enough to spend time with a family that's curious and not threatened and they'll hang out with me. And I always feel very, very, very lucky for that. And then uh, in the Red Desert Complex in Wyoming, uh, which I've been visiting since 2016, um, I got to know another group of families pretty well. And uh, the horses would hang out at the water hole. They would they would uh they would sit quiet sit quietly with me um the most of the pictures of the horse behind me blue zeus he, he mm -hmm. and his family i got to know really well and uh he was like oh it's the lady with the camera again mm -hmm. but he was very patient with me and i loved spending time with him he was be very devoted to his mares and his foals and um when his family was rounded up in 2020 it was absolutely heartbreaking, but a very good ending for him and his family. Most of them were reunited at Skydog Sanctuary. So at least That's they get good. together. But a very, very tiny percentage of our wild horses have that opportunity after they're rounded up. They're really safest staying out on our public lands where they belong. So... Uh, the argument is that they're not doing well. I mean, the crazy argument. They're not doing well. And I've been up in Tahoe. I've even photographed horses so healthy and vibrant. I mean, yes. so healthy and vibrant. They look like mine. And I pay a, mil pay a million on supplements, you know? Um, yes, they were body score fives when they came in from the roundup. And the horses that were rounded up in the Red Desert... Um, they went to Canyon City, which is a prison facility. Um, it's a BLM facility. And when I was finally able to get in there, most of the horses had lost a tremendous amount of weight. They were not being fed sufficiently. And we raised the alarm about it, but nothing, well, actually now they are feeding them better. But my adopted Mustang, who's uh, a yearling, he was probably body score three when he came out and he has put on weight and he looks great now, but he looked terrible and no horses in holding facilities should be treated that way. And if they cannot take care of the horses, they should not round them up. And if they cannot offer them to the public to adopt, they should not round them up. So um, there in the San Marsh Basin herd, which is a very famous herd in Colorado, recently had an adoption, uh, 73 horses, but there are, there were 630 sand wash horses in Canyon City. And there are people who want these horses. And they say that they're going to schedule more adoptions, but there's no reason that the public should not have access to them. Why aren't they letting them out for adoption? Well, they're saying that uh, they're pleading COVID, you know, even though Colorado has opened up and the facility where the horses are is outdoors. Uh, there should be no reason that there shouldn't be people there. They're also pleading understaffing. And um, as I said, they should not be rounding up more horses if they cannot offer them to the public. And if they cannot, you know, if there cannot be homes for them. And it's very a very small percentage of the horses that are rounded up each year actually find homes. And the other issue we've been having this year is the AIP, the Adoption Incentive Program, People are taking their $1,000 that they get when they adopt a horse. And then once they get that money, they're dumping them at slaughter auctions. Oh, my God. And making money. And it, it is horrendous. It is really horrendous. And American Wild Horse Campaign has a lawsuit right now to try to eradicate this program. You know, in theory, it sounds great. Oh, you'll get $1,000. You can use it for training. But that's not what people are doing. That's so horrible. <laughs> So I want people to understand how these animals are rounded up. What happens when a helicopter buzzes over a horse, a herd of horses? So if you're at a roundup, um, now the BLM has become very, very um, limited on uh, observation. So, so, so I, I am two miles away from the trap 
which is ridiculous. It's hard to see anything. And often they'll put the trap itself out of sight. They send a helicopter out to find the horses. The coutures use two helicopters instead of one. And they will drive them. You're basically using fear to chase them. You know, the fear of the helicopter. It's a ter terrifying. Terrifying. They run. And if they are pushed too hard, as happened at the Sandwash Roundup, the foals get left behind, which is unbelievably cruel, especially when they're little foals. And the horses that maybe have an injury or they're older and they can't keep up, they get left behind. And they will send riders out to rope them, which is also very traumatic for the horses. So the helicopter pushes them toward this trap. There's, there's wings that funnel them in. And then there's a horse called a Judas horse. He is a domestic horse trained by the contractor that when they let him go, he runs to the trap. And the horses, horses will follow other horses. That's their thing. So they see this horse running and they follow him into the trap. And they immediately separate the stallions from the mares and the mares from the foals. Um, and then they um, truck them to um, by horse trailer to a temporary holding facility. And then from there to uh, short-term holding. And for horses that have been in a herd, what does that sound like? It's got to be just the worst sound on the planet when they're in their holding facility. It's when you go, when I go in and I see them and they had been so full of life and spirit and freedom. And then I see them in these pens, these dirty pens, these filthy pens, um, standing around, not with their family anymore. And like all hope has out, gone out of their eyes. It is, it is devastating, um, much more devastating for them than for me, but it's really hard to see. Yeah. Really hard to see. And to think that the best these horses can hope for is getting adopted by somebody who's not going to dump them at an auction. It's horrific. And why, why, so let's go back to like the BLM. Why are they saying that we shouldn't have that much, that many horses on this land? So the horses are outnumbered by livestock by about 50 or 100 to 1 on the lands where they are supposed to be the principal species. But the livestock grazing associations have a tremendous amount of power in Congress and they are getting their way. And the BLM is just going ahead with it. Their plan is over five years to remove 100,000 horses, which is virtually all the horses that are left on our public lands. Um, to get to this number that they think there should be out there. But the problem is they're sterilizing, her they're planning to sterilize herds and they're planning to zero out herds so there will be no horses in certain areas. Like in Wyoming, um, the checkerboard herds, uh, Doby Town, Saltwells Creek, Great Divide Basin, White Mountain and Little Colorado, they're planning to zero out three of these herds. And we we're just waiting for that uh, plan to drop but American Wild Horse Campaign is going to do a lawsuit to stop that. Um, other herds, they're, they're using IUDs and wild mares, which is just an insane thing. It's like, why would you do this to a wild mare? Why would you torture her uh, in a study? Um, Oklahoma State University is doing this. Um, and instead of using birth control that is proven and actually works to control the population, and actually, there's no wild horse overpopulation. So in theory, you really don't even need birth control. So it's just, it's a terrible thing. And as I said, the Department of Interior, it's like, they're just, they're, they are completely blowing us off. It's like they have their plans for our public lands and nothing's going to stop them. What's really sad is that I know President has wild horse issues, but it's just not a priority on his list. And I had had so much hope when we had the new administration coming in that we could actually make a change and that we could actually stop this and stop the roundups. And it's just not happening. And so there are a lot of organizations that are behind this and have a bigger ear with Congress. 
what organization are you with that you advocate for that we could get behind? Well, I'm, I'm not currently on the board of any organization, but as I said, I do work in partnership with American Wild Horse Campaign. They're the largest wild horse advocacy group in the country. And they do lawsuits to stop. I've been on seven mm. lawsuits with them so far to stop various things that have been happening. Um, they also um, they also have lobbies in Congress. They also work very hard to educate the public. So they're doing good work. There, there are other organizations that are doing terrific work as well. Um, I'm not saying that there aren't. And everybody has something they can contribute. Um, people, I often hear people lament that all the wild horse advocates should get together and be on the same page and do the same thing. And I'm like, no, people are different. Everybody has a contribution to make. And I think that all of us can, can do something to help the wild horses. And, and that really comes back to this group that you know, you're speaking to is like you as an artist were, um, you know, animal communicators, healers, a lot of people with deep sensitivity that feel like there's nothing they can do and they get overwhelmed. Yes. So maybe there are some things that you could share that we could do. Absolutely. So I have a, I actually have a, a blog on my education website, wildhoofbeats.com, and I will issue alerts and where people can actually send in comments or do something at a particular time to help. Uh, you should sign up for American Wild Horse Campaign's newsletter. They have action items and alerts that people can take action on, sign petitions, write their congressman. And the biggest thing that you can do is be in communication with your representatives and senators and let them know what the issues are and that you care about these wild horses. That's so important. And um, there will be from time to time things that people can do to take action. People need to do and educate your friends, educate your friends and your family and let people know that there are wild horses because a lot of people don't even know that there's wild horses in 10 Western states. So having, you know, when people get, get discouraged, I tell them, you know, if, if the internet and social media has helped wild horses tremendously mm -hmm. as far as exposing people to the issues and to the horses. And um, people fall in love with the horses, seeing pictures of them on, on Facebook. And I think that if we really hadn't started getting thousands and thousands more people involved, we would have no wild horses left yeah. right now. So we are making progress. It's just not looking the way, quite the way we want right now. And it's not time to just give up and say it's not working. It's time in there and keep getting the word out. Yeah. And and the thing that I love is that you've used your art, right? Like you've, you've, I mean, people relate to stories and to photos. And so you've used your art to create a continuum of these, of these wild horses, even if they've been adopted into somebody's home or are still out there on the range. And so it, in addition to getting all this stuff done politically um with with there's other ways too to be sharing stories and i and i feel like sometimes getting to know like following some of these groups you're getting to know these you know the stallion of this group or the you know the mayor or this mayor just had a baby like all of that is so important to follow and yeah and people uh some of the more famous herds have Facebook groups like Anaki has a Facebook group, mm -hmm. uh, Wild Horses of Sandwash Basin. Um, there's uh, the Saltwells Creek Horses have a group. Um, the Prior Mountain Mustang, Wild Mustang Center has a group. You know, so people can get involved. They can follow the horses that they love and they can find out if there's an issue, if there's going to be a roundup and they can send their comments in. Because even if people say, well, I, I did comments on this and they went ahead anyway. Well, the problem is if people don't comment, then they say, oh, everybody's okay with what we're doing. And, right. and we're not, you know, and we're not. And so it, it, it is very important for 
for people to speak up. Yeah, it's it's very important. Um, so do you do you teach photography still for horses? I actually don't. I used to do, I used to take workshops out, but um, I haven't been doing it since COVID. And uh, you know, I, I do occasionally. I have people to my house and photo and have them photograph my mustangs with me for a couple hours. So I, I do that, but I haven't been doing big workshops anymore. The thing is, when you a sanctuary is a good place to do a workshop mm. because the horses are contained and it's a little easier to find them. But out in the wild, it's I like to be by myself with the mm. horses. And having a group is pretty intrusive yeah. with them. So I don't, I don't like that at all. So um, I, I think it's, you know, it, I have led a workshop at a sanctuary before at Black Hills Wild Horse Sanctuary, and that went really well. Um, so that's, to me, it seems to be the best way to do it. And I also have a book on horse photography that teaches people how to take pictures of horses and wild horses. Yeah, I may have to check that out because uh, God knows. I know Claudia is going to be checking that one out. Um, but I also think people should get out there and see wild horses while we have them. I agree. Uh, we, we have wild horses in 10 western states. These are the ones that are managed by the Bureau of Land Management. And you can just pick a state, say Colorado and Google wild horses, Colorado, BLM, and a list of the herd management areas will pop up and some of them have maps more of them used to but now but some of them have maps and you can go out and explore and find wild horses that's pretty cool i mean like you i've i've taken people on uh i did eight years of dolphin trips and six oh, nice. years of uh wildlife trips doing animal communication just more connection or uh communion i would say just being really quiet and being with them um, and so here I've flown around the world, but, uh, it's like, it's right here at home. Yes, it and, is. Yes, it is. So know. two herds, three herds, I would recommend people visit because they're have fairly easy access is, uh, McCullough Peaks herd near Cody, Wyoming. Um, they're only 16 miles from town and the horses have been used to people. So you'll have a better opportunity to be able to find them and get near enough to take pictures. The Prior Mountain uh, Wild Herd in Montana and the Prior Mountain Wild Mustang Center takes tours up there and they know all the horses and it's a beautiful, beautiful place. And uh, also Sand Wash Basin in Colorado. Um, it's about an hour from Craig, Colorado. And the horses there are, as I said, sort of used to people so you'll have a better opportunity finding them and spending time with them so those are three herds just right off the bat that i can suggest and, and I, oh. yeah yeah i was going to say the, the herd outside of tahoe too that i saw was that they're they're not entirely habituated but they were okay with us pretty close oh and the anaki herd which is outside of salt lake city um, they are a very well-known herd, and um, the horses are wonderful. And so um, do you have any <clears> – <throat> we should probably get a list from you. I, am, I assume there's stuff on your website about who we should be reaching out to, how we could be helping. Um, well, as I said, the primary people that it's going to be most effective to reach out to are your own senators and representatives. So, yeah. Uh, Claudia, does anyone, has anyone commented or? Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, okay, so we have quite a few people. Maureen Lissonette was talking about the, the wild boroughs because that's what she volunteers with. Uh, talking about forest can service. You, can you go closer to your microphone? Is that better? Yes. Okay. So, so um, talking about the, they're about around 400 horses in the Apache forest. I think I'm getting a lot of feedback on your end, by the way. Um, 
me see who else. Uh, there's, a, yeah, there's a roundup. There's a roundup happening right now in the Apache uh, National Forest. It's going to be well. It's going to be starting, I think, in a few days, and that's the Forest Service. And the Forest Service horses they can take directly to auction. They, um, the Bureau of Land Management, cannot do that. Um, but the Forest Service can just round them up and take them to auction, and that is happening right now. So if you want to Google um, Apache National Forest and look for what uh, what you can do, it's it's hard. It's it's like you can write, you can call, but it it may not change anything. So that's going on right now. But we still have to do it. Yes, we do. Yes, we do. My focus is mostly on the Wyoming horses, uh, Wyoming, Colorado, and Montana horses. Those are the ones that I've spent m the most time with and know the herds the best. So Judith Boyle has a question. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm not going through all the comments and questions. We can go back and answer all of them, but the, I, I'm going to the latest one. Judith Boyle wants to know, do you think the BLM will target iconic horses in these herds after the last... Um, SWB adoption event that generated so much interest and money. Sandwash Basin is SWB. Um, that people will target them? I don't understand. She says uh, we'll target iconic horses in these herds because the event generated so much interest and money. Oh. No. You know, I don't. I, the Sandwash herd had not been rounded up since 2008, and it was rounded up last year. So the horses actually had a very lucky time that they weren't being rounded up every three years. I don't think they deliberately target iconic horses, but it, it doesn't really matter because the horses are gone. And um, what I would like to see is all of the horses that are currently at Canyon City from San Luis Basin be offered to the public instead of keeping them there and not letting people adopt them if they do want to adopt them. Sorry, I guess... It's hard. It's very. This is a very hard subject because we're. I mean, you, you fall in. Love, you fall in love with these horses, and going back into an area after a roundup has happened, and those horses are no longer there, and you look for them where you used to find them, and it's like going into an area with ghosts, and it's heartbreaking. And thinking about not that I will never know what happened to most of these horses. I will never know. When they get sent to long-term holding, you can no longer adopt them. You can buy them by the truckload, but you can't adopt them. And you can't look for a particular horse. So um, there's a very sh there's usually a short amount of time where you where they should be offered to the public, but it's not happening. The BLM's overwhelmed. They removed over 19,000 horses last year. They can't even, they don't even have enough people working in the holding facilities to feed these horses, let alone process them for adoption. It's absurd. And to continue rounding them up, which they will be starting, um, they can start this month. Uh, they can't, or no, they start, they can start in July. They can't round up during foaling season. The Bureau of Land Management cannot round up during foaling season. So we have until July right now. Go ahead, I have Claudia. a question personally for Carol. Given how heart wrenching this is and how difficult and painful it can be, how do you deal with the compassion fatigue? Yeah, how do you deal with compassion fatigue? You know, I I find when I'm at a roundup, I have to kind of just stuff everything down because I, I don't want to be crying in front of the BLM and I need to be able to hold it together so I can be an observer and get the information out. But I come home and it's really hard. Um, spending time with my own adopted Mustangs, I have three here at my house, and my dogs helps me tremendously. And I have friends in the wild horse advocacy world that I talk to and they understand. And that really helps too. But I, you know, I came to my purpose very late in life. You know, I was, I figured out what, what I was here for in my 40s. And um, I had been looking for a long time. And I really feel that I'm here to help the wild horses. And that's not going to change. That's why I'm here. And I am determined to do everything I can 
uh, while I'm here to uh, to help them. And uh, so times when I have a hard time and I have to just pull back and I can't I can't go to roundup after roundup. That just it is soul destroying. Um, but I do spend time with the horses out in the wild, the ones that are there, and that is the best. It's just uh, an amazing experience when a family of wild horses lets me in and lets me spend time with them. It's a yeah. gift. It's a tremendous gift, and there is nothing like it, and I wouldn't give it up for the world. Mm. Joan, your famous line, Joan, your mission and your my mission remember your mission is bigger than oh yeah i always say that our mission is bigger than our feelings so if we feel you know if we feel overwhelmed or we feel hurt, you know just wrecked by it all we still have to be you know th this is much more important than our than our feelings in the moment and it's been a tremendously hard year it was it's been a tremendously hard year one yeah. round of or another and um, horses that I know and love disappearing. It's and having to fight to get into the facilities to adopt them is ridiculous. That's and ridiculous. yeah, yeah. Well, there's a whole bunch more people that are going to be. Um, yeah, the Bureau of Land Management. All these people aren't going to know what hit them because we've got our group here. And um, um, we've got, you know, people that then watch this later on YouTube. So we're we're part of spreading the word and yes. getting out there. Yes. Um, and I can't thank you enough for your work. And it's funny, a few people on this thread, apparently, you've photographed their animals over the years. So <laughs> it's great. I know. I was thinking, what, I wonder what, you know, I have a new... I got another book deal. I'm thinking I need a new headshot. What okay. would it take? <laughs> <laughs> we can talk. <laughs> All right. I've got some cute horses outside. So uh, anyway. So cute. So cute. Yeah. One of my horses is going to be 35 on April wow. 3rd. So that's amazing. Yeah. It's a big deal. Um, anyway, I cannot tell you how much I appreciate your work. As I said, I've followed you for a long time. I've known about the heartbreak this year and just, um, you know, I kind of silently lurk in the background, but I have been watching for years and, and have seen just how horrifying this year has been for the horses and the work you do. And I just can't thank you enough for the work you're doing and please keep Stay healthy so you can keep doing it. We're right behind you. Thank you. Thank you. I will. Thank you, Carol. Yeah. Thank, thank you so much for having me on. I appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you.